Okay, so let me introduce the first speaker. Uh, he is Dr. Philip D. Jaffe. Uh, Dr. Philip Jaffe served as the coordinator of the General Comment Number 25 Working Group. Currently, he is the Vice Chair of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and a full professor at the Center for Children's Rights Studies of the University of Geneva, which I'm very interested in studying in there. So uh, today's, uh, uh, his presentation objective is to present the development process of the general comment number 25. So uh, here uh, we give the floor to Dr. Philip Jaffe. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, dear colleagues, I'm very pleased to be able to share with you some thoughts on the Committee on the Rights of the Child's latest general comment, number 25, children's rights in relation to the digital environment. This comment, this general comment was launched officially on March 24 of this year. And since then, there have been several regional events to promote the guidance it provides. Because time is of the essence, let me focus on three main takeaways. First takeaway, uh, I feel totally comfortable stating that General Comment 25 is a really good document. There are two reasons for this. First, the committee worked really hard. And second, we were inspired by the top-notch specialists, Baroness Kidron, Professor Livingston, and Professor Third, who you will hear from in a moment. Their expertise and my colleagues from the committee permeate the general, um, the general comment. The challenge for the committee was not only to produce a shiny statement, but in, but in addition, uh, to the inner workings of a general comment have to be very precise. Next slide, please. No rights can be forgotten and everything had to be in conformity with human rights jurisprudence. This may seem very obvious, but to reach this goal was a rather dizzying process. The committee had to make sure that the general comment covered children's digital rights while taking into account children's evolving capacities in a digital universe that is changing at lightning speed, along with technological advances that move much faster than governmental regulations. I believe the general comment ends up having a good shelf life and it will not become obsolete in just a year or two. And sorry to belabor this point, but the, the digital human rights of children may be about today, but the pace of the digital societal transformation is such that we are dealing literally with living rights living children's human rights. The second takeaway is when you read the general comment or already if you have, you will realize that it's all in there. Next slide. Best interests of the child, check. Evolving capacities, check. Access, non-discrimination, privacy, autonomy, protection, check, 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 check. Very important to me, freedom of expression, participation, freedom of association, and peaceful assembly, all there as well as all the rest. Now, everyone has his or her favorite passage of a book or a line in a movie or even a passage in a general comment. So my favorite line, which I would like to share with you, relates to the best interests argument. And let me read parts of a paragraph 12 and paragraph 13 of the general comment slowly and let it soak in because I will not comment beyond putting an emphasis on certain words. States parties should ensure that in all actions regarding the provision, regulation, design, management, and use of the digital environment, the best interest of every child is a primary consideration. States parties should involve the national and local bodies that oversee the fulfillment of the rights of children in such actions. In considering the best interests of the child, they should have regard for all children's rights, including their rights to seek, receive, 
and impart information, to be protected from harm, and to have their views given due weight, and ensure transparency in the assessment of the best interests of the child and the criteria that have been applied. Next slide. It is all in there. And I think that we succeeded in striking a good balance be between staring lucidly at the perils and dangers of the digital environment, while also addressing the positive opportunities it provides for learning, health, leisure, psychological development, and so on. The third and final takeaway is this. A general comment is only as good as the impact it generates. Obviously, like all general comments, number 25 provides states parties to the Convention on the Rights of the Child with authoritative guidance. A general comment may not be binding like the convention itself, but it becomes a thematic benchmark on which the committee will rely to inquire and evaluate how children's rights are respected on this topic in a given country. So it inherently generates momentum within the purview of the committee's work. But that is the easy part. The impact of this particular general comment depends on how governments evolve and generate regulatory frameworks that will tame the wild, wild west of the digital environment. New laws, of course, but also regulatory bodies, ideally somewhat independent and binding. Bodies that are able to influence the, the business sector, the gaming industry, for example, to reform and to put children's rights at the heart of their business model and not just see children as clients and spenders. And finally, because it is absolutely true, the impact of this general comment depends on the strength and drive of civil society organizations. There is, I believe, a natural alliance that must be continuously nurtured between the committee, states parties, but also most, most importantly, children and civil society organizations that operate in the trenches of children's lives with and for children, promoting and protecting their rights. So let me end here with a somewhat corny statement Many thanks to CRC Asia and the good work you carry out. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Philip. I, I think this, uh, this general comment is very important. I think before the convention come into effect, uh, before 1989, no one expects the digital, we have such a, a proactive digital environment in this world. So this general comment really comes in time. And, and thanks for giving an overview in, and a process in developing it. So let me introduce uh, the second presentation. They are a joint presentation by two speakers, uh, but I will introduce in one go, but they, uh, they will uh, have the uh, presentation divided into part one and part two. Uh, for part one, it will, uh, the first speaker is uh, Baroness Biban Kidron OBE, and she is the founder and chair of Five Rice Foundation, a member of the General Comment Number Twenty Five Steering Group that provided support to the CLC Committee on the three year development of the document. And the second speaker is Professor Sonia Livingstone OBE, is the lead author of the Five Rice General Comment Number. 25 steering group. She is also a full professor at the Department of Media and Communications of the London School of Economics and Political Science. So today's their presentation's objective is to share about the general comment number 25 salient features and areas and themes that prove particularly divisive and challenging. So um, may I give the floor to Baroness Biban Kidra? Uh, th thank you, Billy, so much for that introduction and good morning from London to all of you. Good afternoon where you are. Um, I am uh, Biban Kidron. I'm the chair of 
uh, Five Rights Foundation. And our mission is to build the digital world that children deserve. So it was an enormous privilege to be the consultants on the drafting of the general comment. Um, and uh, as you've already heard, it was led by Professor Sonia Livingston, who will speak shortly. And, um, and you will also hear from our colleague, Professor Amanda Third, uh, in a moment. The drafting took place over many months and it had an extraordinary number of meetings and consultations with experts at state uh, and community level right across the globe. An overwhelming number of written submissions and scores of workshops with children in 28 countries. My point here is that the drafting process was a very exacting and inclusive one. And the reason that I raised the process first is to say, really to underline that both we at Five Rights Foundation and the general comment uh, working group of the CRC understood the global importance of the general comment. Almost every part of a child's life is impacted by the presence or absence of digital technology. And many states, organizations, campaigners, lawmakers were struggling to understand how children's rights intersected with those technologies. More importantly, they were anxious about what they should be doing. This is a new and fast changing technology and whilst most people had an idea about some part of its impact or importance, it seemed that no one had a clear overview of the whole. And at the same time, the digital world was galloping ahead without due consideration of the rights of children. And our task as we saw it was to ensure that the general comment provided a holistic framework of what good looks like. With the adoption of the general comment, we have that framework. It is at one, holistic and practical. It sets out the actions that states and business must take to protect and enable children in the digital world to flourish. It was very well received and we are indeed very proud of it. But a document of this nature must not be measured on the page, nor on the day of its adoption, it must be measured in how it is now used, and finally how it impacts on the lived experience of children. Since it was adopted, it has been cited in legislation, in protocols and policies, for example, the EU, uh, in the EU, it now forms part of the Artificial Intelligence Act, the Children's Rights Strategy, and the upcoming Digital Services Act, among others. It has been used by the OECD as a foundational document to its recently adopted privacy framework for children, similarly used by the Irish Data Protection Commissioner. It's been welcomed by the United Nations Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development Goals, the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, the International Telecommunications Union, UNESCO, We Protect Global Alliance, uh, and the World Health Organization, and also the African Union Cybersecurity Community and other security services around the world. It has also been and continues to be raised at state level and in parliaments around the world. The reason that I make reference to this very long list is that among the goals of this morning's launch is to ensure that organizations, government and third sector across the Asia Pacific and beyond grasp the opportunity that the general comment allows. It is an agreed and articulated consensus framework for child protection and rights. And we must start to embed it with the understanding that what it holds within it is a set of actions that will not only protect children, 
but also allow them to flourish online. In a moment, Sonia is going to go through some of the key issues, but I want to be to finish by underlining the holistic nature of the general comment. There will be some of you who work in education and will rush to the section on digital literacy. There will be those who look to see what it says about affordability and access or child sexual abuse. But I suspect there will be less of you who rush to the sections on regulating automated systems, artificial intelligence and machine learning, or what must be done to protect the right to an inner life from those same automated systems. So I would urge all of you to look at the whole. If the general comment gives us one gift, it is understanding it is an understanding of the specific nature of the digital world. The general comment is an opportunity to consider everything from the ground up and to ensure that we do not only what we understand, not only what is convenient, but actually what is necessary for children to flourish online. The digital world has transformed childhood and the general comment is a practical tool to transform the digital world so that the transformation respects and realizes children's rights. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you very much, Biban. And I'm going to um, uh, share my slides just to um, uh, illustrate some of the points, in fact, that the previous speakers have made. And thank you so much for um, including me in today's uh, event. So I believe you can now um, see my um, slides. Um, I just want to take us back uh, briefly to um, 2014, when really the process uh, of producing this general comment began. Um, it's now already, if you like, a, a bit of a different world, a world when we, uh, the Committee on the Rights of the Child called a day of general discussion about digital media and children's rights. Um, and the very title, I think, illustrates something of the challenge that this general comment is designed to um, address because uh, we've moved from a time when children could choose to engage with digital media um, if they were fortunate enough to have access to a time in which um, uh, uh, digital media have become, uh, as it were, the digital environment and um, uh, an essential part of the environment in which they all live. Um, an environment which has its own infrastructure, architecture, systems, business models, and global scale. A global scale that is often bigger than states, uh, so complex that it's not well understood by politicians and civil society, and that is unavoidable in its effects, um, even on those that cannot uh, individually access it. So that kind of shift from the, the, the original plan for producing a general comment at that day of general discussion in 2014 um, became a process that uh, the previous speakers have uh, indicated from 2018-19 until now. A process that involved a global consultation uh, with children, as um, Professor Amanda Third will um, outline in a moment. Um, so I just saw, is my, am I still in presentation view or? Yes, um, we can see your notes. Ah, okay. That's not how I wanted it to be. Let me just try again. Um, uh, maybe I should share this one. Does that work look better? Is that right now? Yes. Yes, okay. Oh, very good. All right. I'm um, struggling with my own technology, clearly. Um, uh, and I just wanted to um, uh, make a point that behind um, the general comment and the consultations is also um, a process of evidence. Um, I saw recently that the um, 
Philippines general, um, the Philippines uh, Kids Online project has recently produced its own um, uh, findings on which which captures some of the dilemma really for the general comment that one in two children in the Philippines now use the internet uh, for their schoolwork, but also one in or fewer than one in two children feel safe online. Um, so the, the the kind of the double edged sword of the general comment um, and it's it it has to meet has to meet the way in which the internet is both uh, beneficial and um, potentially harmful for many children and the thinking which I will just briefly indicate um, I believe I have um, a few minutes uh, left um, I would just like to kind of indicate uh, the way in which the whole of the convention on the rights of the child uh, is relevant to um, uh, children's life in a digital world because the internet, because the digital environment is so cross-cutting. Uh, but some of the uh, articles in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which I'm just showing a very uh, summary version of here, um, we can see is uh, have a new kind of meaning in uh, in the in the digital um, world. So just to highlight some, um, the importance of non-discrimination, uh, Article 2 has a very particular significance really um, in a digital environment where all kinds of discrimination and exclusion uh, often calculated by algorithms in ways that politicians and others don't understand very well. Um, the Article 2 has a new uh, significance and a lot of the thinking in the convention in, in the general comment had to really address the varieties of discrimination that now um, matter. Um, Article 3, the importance of best interests, um, Professor Jaffe has already commented on. Uh, this becomes a particularly important um, when thinking about the responsibilities of business and how business must um, put children's best interests as a priority and especially um, that the best interests should not be trumped by the commercial interests. This becomes a real issue in relation to certain ways in which businesses um, apply commercial pressure to um, their users, including uh, children. Uh, Article 12 was uh, has been very important but often contentious in the convention. It's equally important in the general comment. Um, every child has the right um, to express their views in matters that affect them and those must be taken seriously. This still does not really happen in multi-stakeholder debates about uh, the digital environment, about the uh, nature of technological innovation and especially when states come to develop their uh, laws, regulations and practices to address the digital environment. So the importance of children being heard and of adults learning from children is really um, uh, critical. Uh, in the, uh, the consultations on the general comment and indeed in the framing of the general comment, that delicate balance in Article 5 between children's evolving capacity and children and parents responsibility to guide and uh, support their children this is something that runs all the way through the general comment um, and again has been really um, crucial and i would emphasize here the thinking that um, children should be um, protected from harms in the digital environment up to the age of 18 across their full range of um, uh, childhood but they should be enabled uh, to be actors and, um, of course, rights holders in the digital environment from as early as their evolving capacity permits. And of course, that generates tensions. The emphasis on the, in the general comment in regard to parenting is really that states should do all they can and businesses also to support parents in what is a difficult role rather than burden them and leave them on their own to manage um, an incredibly difficult uh, task. Um, uh, the Committee on the Rights of the Child made a, an early decision to emphasise um, protection from uh, forms of violence, abuse, neglect and so forth in the digital environment. 
um, but not to make the whole general comment so protectionist that children's civil rights and freedoms um, are neglected. And I'm aware that um, uh, many of the um, civil society actors uh, at this event today um, are really grappling with the difficulties of the um, risks that the children that the digital environment poses to children. Um, the general comment emphasizes the importance of uh, coordination and cooperation, both nationally and internationally, because many of these um, crimes and forms of, of abuse are perpetrated uh, um, and, and mediated globally. Uh, but it also um, uh, tries to find a way to have a balanced view that recognizes um, some uh, um, exposure to risk builds resilience and children will need to grow up and live in the digital world. And so the emphasis must be on really targeting forms of support to those children who are most at risk and where they really need it. Um, the range of harms um, uh, is kind of left open in article in, in the convention in Article 36. And I think anyone dealing with the digital world is fully aware of the, of the wide range of harms that children need to be protected on. Anything that happens offline, anything that um, we have long worried about in the child rights world now has a digital dimension. And if everyone, as it were, in the child rights world asked about that digital dimension when addressing, when going about their work, one would capture much more effectively uh, the way in which the online and offline are now integrated. Um, the uh, general comment also addresses some of the issues of um, uh, education, um, information, um, and civil rights and liberties. Um, it's really crucial to keep that balance, to recognise that children are rights holders and to find ways um, that the uh, both governments, but also businesses and civil society actors can all keep in mind children, the full uh, range of children's um, rights. So I'm not going to go through all of them. The right to play is really crucial. I realise it's controversial in relation to screen time and claims of addiction. Um, and there is kind of much that we might develop um, in the uh, discussion. I just want to highlight the child's right to privacy and the way in which the general comment really relies on best practice in developing uh, data protection regulation and the importance of data protection regulation in every state if the child's right to privacy uh, interpersonally also in relation to the state and business um, is to be um, protected. Um, so I will um, leave it at this uh, point. Um, there are many kind of further um, elements of the general comment that really point to the importance of the right to of, of remedy, of due diligence, of um, coordination and cooperation, of um, uh, recognising the importance of targeting those most at risk and and never um, uh, um, and being aware of the um, potential costs to children's positive rights um, from some uh, forms of action that are um, uh, that may be um, more led by moral panics than by um, uh, evidence. So evidence kind of has to underpin uh, the work, and that's why this is is also so important. So um, I can't uh, continue further, so I will um, leave it at this point. Um, everything about the general comment and the explanatory notes um, and relevant reports are available at this website and um, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you Sonia. Thank you Biban and Sonia and who give us more information details about the GC25 and now we have a video presentation and this is uh, it's actually a child-friendly version of the GC25. This is a video of children from across the world speaking the words written by other children and young people to share the general comment. So uh, with this video, so uh, if we can widely share, more children will know about their rights in the digital world. So if uh, it is ready, uh, let the technical team uh, launch the video.
Pick up. What do you think about digital world? You know that the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child is the most signed agreement in history. 196 countries, including Ghana, signed this agreement. Over 30 years ago, in 1989, the United Nations wrote the Convention on the Rights of the Child to set out the freedoms and protections that countries must give children and younger people under the age of 18 years old. That was the same year as the internet was invented. This means that the people who wrote the convention had no idea of the change that digital technology will bring to young people's lives. But the good news is that the Committee on the Rights of the Child, who look after the convention, have written down ways by which children should be treated in the digital world. Watoto malipopote duniani wanatumia mitandao kwa ajili ya kupata burudani, kupata taarifa, kwa ajili ya shule, ku wanawasiliano na marafiki na familia. Hivyo wanataka mtandao uwe wa haki na wawe salama wanapotumia. There are four principles of children's rights. Yajib himayat al-atfal min al-tamiz wa muamalatuhum bi insaf ayyan kan. Mo cho phát triển theo hướng mong muốn của trẻ em và không bị ai ảnh hưởng và can thiệp tới. When making any decision, adults, including governments and businesses, must do what is best for children rather than themselves. Mind you, not all children are the same. At different ages, children need different technologies, supports, and freedoms. As they get older, they have more understanding and experience, so should be able to do and see a broader range of things. Expert call these involving capacities. The digital world must take account of this in the way it provides for different ages. But how should we do this? Linda Hakiza Totum Tandaoni. Make rules that support children's rights online. Ensure that everyone understands the rules, including the government officials, businesses, parents, teachers, and children themselves. Listen to children when they have a problem. Stop businesses putting profit above children's rights. Make sure that children know and understand what action is being taken. Children have the right to information, freedom and privacy. A information that as crianças encontram online deve ser verdadeira, relevante e facilmente disponível a menos que possa causar danos. Children must have privacy to act and grow in a way that they wish. This includes privacy from parents, school, governments, businesses, and each other. Children should be able to say what they think. Kinder Unternehmen und andere Menschen sollten aber keine Lügen verbreiten oder andere angreifen. Kinder wollen sich mit ihren Freunden treffen, Zeit mit ihnen verbringen und in jeder Umgebung Teil ihrer Gesellschaft sein. Regierungen und Unternehmen sollten dies nicht verhindern, außer aus Gründen der Sicherheit. Children may need to prove who they are in order to be part of the community. So the government must give them a way of proving who they are online. However, this should not be used in ways that are unfair or attack a child's privacy or other rights. Children have the right to protection from violence, including political violence, encouragement to self-harm, eating disorders and suicide, bullying and images of sexual violence or sexual contact with adults. معكم مهرة من مدينة الشارقة صديقة للأطفال واليافعين. الحماية من الإساءة والعنف حق لجميع الأطفال. Government and businesses should make sure that children aren't exploited or exposed to violence by adults or other children when they are online. Governments should not assume that all children have families or support and access to advice. They should make sure that the digital world looks after children's needs from the start and that families and caregivers have the information they need. Governments and businesses should make sure that children with disabilities are able to join the digital world. Subtitles and voice support and any other help they might need should be the normal settings so they can be used or switch off. Спокойно применять, управлять ими, а не искать, как этим воспользоваться. 
health information must be accurate and health services and advice for children must be private and confidential. No digital service should be allowed that interferes with the child's well-being and all physical and mental health services that engage with children must be checked to make sure they put children first. Government should make sure that children are not exposed to health misinformation. A educação pode ser mais divertida e eficaz com o uso de ferramentas digitais, mas é importante que as ferramentas de educação respeitem a privacidade das crianças e apoiem sua educação de maneira adequada. Children want to understand how the digital world works and who is benefiting from it. This should be taught in schools alongside technical skills. Having free time is important. Parents should be encouraged to understand their interests and play in the digital world. Although it is also to see people face to face. This meet online must be fair, clear, and be held to the same standard as offline business. Online businesses should not share our personal information, such as our photos, private conversations, videos, or comments, to make money. Children of different age in different situations from all over the world deserve the same protection. Digital services should be accessible to all children and available in all the languages the children speak. Five Rights Foundation is extremely grateful to the nearly 300 young people from 28 countries who contributed to writing the text of In Our Own Words. In Our Own Words is written by and for young people. It is their own version of General Comment 25 that sets out how children's rights apply in the digital environment. These are just a few of the over 1,000 young people who contributed their views to the general comment itself. Thank you all. Yes, good. So the video is really cute, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I I personally enjoy a lot in the uh, uh, in the production period with the children. And thanks Five Rice Foundation for for providing the script and all the very child friendly guidelines. So uh, let's move on to the uh, third presentation, and this is done by a professor Amanda Third. Um, Professor Amanda Third is the co-director of the Young and Resilient Research Center at Western Sydney University, a member of General Comment Number no. Twenty Five Steering Group. Uh, she took the lead in conducting the children's consultation for the development of General Comment. And so today's Professor Amanda Third's uh, presentation objective is to discuss the results of the GC Twenty Five children's consultations with a particular focus on the results from the Asian region. So may we give the floor to Professor Amanda Thur. Thank you so much, Billy. And um, apologies in advance, folks, <clears throat> that my, <clears throat> my screen is not working for some reason. Um, uh, you know, trust technology to go wrong right as, as, as we need it to, uh, to do the right thing. Um, but thank you very much uh, for the invitation to, um, to speak to you today. It gives me very great pleasure to be able to share with you the insights from the children's consultations that were held to inform the drafting of UNCRC General Comment 25. I want to begin, first of all, by acknowledging that I um, am speaking to you from Gadigal land in Australia uh, and acknowledge that 
um, elders past, present and emerging. I also want to begin by thanking uh, Child Rights Coalition Asia for both organising this wonderful event to activate the General Comment 25, um, but also for their enormous contribution alongside their membership um, to enabling children to participate in this consultation uh, to inform the General Comment. Um, and, I'll, and I'll acknowledge you in more detail in a moment. Um, so before I tell you um, about the consultation process and what children said to a, a quick shout out to 11 year old Jesper Hjorth, who uh, reflected on the findings of the consultation and produced the beautiful black and white images that feature both in the report and uh, on the screen today. Okay, so Oops, just having trouble sharing uh, moving forwards. Oops. Okay. Um, so this diagram, sorry, this diagram uh, shows the process of drafting the general comment, which was led by the Five Rights Foundation in partnership with the UN uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child. Oops, there it is. Um, as you can see, the children's consultations was, uh, were conducted between May and September in 2019, and alongside two rounds of international public consultation and an expert consultation held in London in October 2019, the children's consultations were an important reference point across the drafting process. <laughs> A total of uh, sorry, 709 children in 27 countries, primarily in the Global South, participated in five hour workshops to reflect on and share their views about their rights in the digital age. Workshops were conducted in 19 different languages with 12 workshops conducted in English and 15 in Arabic. Children with diverse needs and experiences participated, including children living with disabilities, children living in out of home care and refugee children. That the general comment 25 opens with quotations from children shows just how important children's contributions have been to shaping the advice for states and others that is contained in the general comment. Over 100 individuals and organizations around the world generously gave of their time and energy to facilitate workshops so that children could, could uh, directly shape General Comment 25. We're enormously indebted to these people for ensuring the consultations were a success. And a very special shout out um, to the organizations who are on your screen at the moment. Um, indeed, the, the collaborative effort that underpinned the consultations really speaks to the strengths of the child rights community internationally. And, and I'm so excited that this community stands ready to activate General Comment 25. The consultations used a creative and participatory workshop process that was designed by the Young and Resilient Research Centre at Western Sydney University. Partner organisations in each country conducted three to five hour face-to-face -face workshops with children in their local settings. And these workshops um, used creative and participatory methods. So children completed a range of individual and group-based activities, uh, including um, creative writing, drawings, cut and paste, and so on, um, to generate some rich data about their perceptions and experiences of their rights in relation to digital media. Um, so what did children have to say? Well, far and away, the biggest challenge for the majority of children around the world is that of securing routine and reliable access to the internet. And this is no less true for children in Asia than elsewhere in the world. Too many children cannot routinely access either devices that work or a stable connection to the internet. Financial constraints are the biggest barrier to children's capacity to harness digital technology in support of their rights. So too, though, children, including in Asia, for many of them, they don't live in places with reliable electricity or reliable connectivity. Gender differences also make, have a powerful role to play in access. Girls in general experience much greater difficulties accessing the internet than boys do. 
And for, in many parts of the world, this is largely due to gendered social norms that suggest girls shouldn't or don't need to engage with digital technology. Furthermore, another barrier to children's access is that they say their parents and their teachers often lack the digital literacies and skills to be able to support their meaningful engagement. All of these things suggest that securing children's access should constitute a key priority for those with responsibility to children in the digital age. Around the world, children use the internet primarily for communication, connection and sharing, followed by seeking information. They see the digital as an overwhelmingly positive influence on their lives, on their prospects and on their rights. And they have very high aspirations for the ways that the digital can help to support them to realize their rights, both online and offline. Children in Asia particularly value technology's role in strengthening their culture. So whilst they have some concerns about the ways that technology might be introducing other influences into their cultures, they're also very convinced that technology can help them learn more about their culture, connect with others who share the same sorts of practices and participate in things like religion and so on. While children are passionately keen to be part of the digital world, though, they're frustrated by its faults and they really feel that it should serve them better. And this is, a, this is an observation across the world, uh, but children in Asia also said this very, very strongly. That, so they do worry about the risks of harm online. Uh, they worry, for example, about uh, in particular things like inappropriate content, especially violent and sexual content. But they're also concerned about things like bullying, uh, kidnapping, murder, and all kinds of quite uh, serious forms of exploitation. And they're calling on states, on technology companies, on parents and carers, on teachers and myriad others to better protect them from these serious risks of harm. And they're calling not only for legislation, but for, um, you know, for, for uh, uh, industry regulation, uh, right through to education uh, to help them meet the, meet the demands of, of managing these risks. Um, so at the same time, though, that whilst children are very, um, I guess, worried about the more extreme end of the, the spectrum of harms they might encounter online, they're very concerned about very everyday, overtly social risks. Um, so the kinds of risks that might come from interacting with their peers, for example, um, you know, the sorts of teenage drama they encounter on social media platforms, etc. Um, and in addition to these social risks, they're quite concerned about the mental health impacts of difficult social interactions online and encountering inappropriate content. There's a need for states and others to acknowledge that children want support to manage these interactions. They, um, and I think there's a real need for us to connect up the way that children think about and relate to ideas about risks of harm at that very everyday level with their capacity to prevent the more serious forms of harm, both to themselves and to others. Children also see technology as absolutely critical to their right to access information. And that right to information they see as particularly important for things like education and for their participation in political and community life, for their health, and much more. And it should be said that while, um, while we know that uh, children's rights are indivisible and we can't privilege uh, certain rights over others, uh, children definitely had views about which rights they thought were more important. <laughs> um, and right to information was among those. Uh, in particular, children who speak languages other than English, uh, such as Arabic, they're calling for more accessible and high quality language, uh, sorry, high quality information, and for that matter, entertainment and other forms of content in the languages that they speak. And this is a, this was a very, uh, this was a very prominent concern uh, in Asia. Uh, so, so again, having access to, to uh, resources in the languages that they speak. Um, but also, I guess, 
children are worried about misinformation. They're very disinclined to trust media companies. They don't have a lot of trust. Um, and they suggest that there is a great scope for tighter regulation of fake news and a real need for children to have opportunities to develop their critical and digital literacies. Uh, so here again, there's a very important role, not only for governments and NGOs, but also for the technology platforms themselves. Children across Asia are also using digital technologies to learn about, maintain and manage their health. They particularly value being able to find answers to health questions that are very difficult to uh, ask um, in, their, in, in the context of their everyday lives because they, they deal with issues that are often taboo in their cultures, issues like mental health and also sexual and reproductive health. Nonetheless, they do find a lot of important and helpful information online, but they're calling out for more and better information about these kinds of things. They also highlight that technology provides them with very important opportunities for leisure, relaxation and play, and that these things, as we've seen during the pandemic, are vital to both their physical and their mental health. So they really see, uh, they really would like adults to take those dimensions of, of um, their digital technology practices seriously. Furthermore, I know that addiction is, is a concern across the region, but far from the internet addicted fiends that adults sometimes imagine them to be, children in Asia were adamant that technology use needs to be balanced with other activities in their lives so that they can maintain good health. And they're asking, you know, they're asking their families to support them to do that, but they also want more trust to be able to do that well. Uh, they're calling on adults to really recognise the critical role that technology plays in opening up opportunities for their health and are calling indeed for, uh, for, for governments and technology corporations to invest in health technologies that, that can support their health. For me, one of the most interesting dimensions of the consultations was the privacy, were the privacy dimensions. Children see their right to privacy as critical to realizing their rights in the digital world. They are sensitized to the fact that uh, private entities are collecting their data, but many are very angry that they don't have enough information about how in particular private companies collect, store and use their data. And they're worried that they're being exploited. They are calling for child-friendly accessible terms and conditions and privacy settings to be made available to them. On family, children are very ambivalent about how technology plays into family life. On the one hand, they say it strengthens their relationships with peers, uh, sorry, with parents, carers, siblings, and extended family members, particularly at times when it's not possible to connect face to face, as we've seen during the pandemic. On the other hand, though, they worry that when their families are together, they're distracted by their gadgets, and this gets in the way of quality time together. Children in Asia believe that parental guidance is absolutely critical to their capacity to use technology well, but they really worry that their parents and carers don't understand what they do online or why it, that they think it's important to engage online. And very importantly, children see a double standard at play in that their parents make rules that often those parents don't follow themselves, like putting your, your phone away at the dinner table. So they're really looking to parents and carers to role model good technology use for them. On expression and identity, um, children say that digital technology is absolutely critical to their uh, capacity to develop their identities, to explore who they are, both as individuals and as members of communities. Um, they also say that they really um, value being able to use technology uh, to take action on the issues that matter to them. And, um, and, and they, they really want to use technology to transform their worlds positively, as we've seen um, with children around the world taking, issue, uh, taking action on issues that matter. But they're also concerned that children, um, that, that 
the ways that children express themselves online and the ways that adults and others express themselves to children should be respectful and that people, people shouldn't be exposed to vilification or shaming for expressing different points of view. Um, but overall, they're very, care they're very wary of the idea that their expression should be censored, right? They instead want platforms to help to put parameters in place to help children manage, um, learn how and learn how to uh, express themselves in ways that are appropriate and for platforms to take responsibility for ensuring that the communities online are positive and supportive. Finally, um, on the issue of education, we see that the problem of access plays out in relation to children's education. Indeed, children were unanimous across the world in their view that technology is an absolute game changer for education. Um, and while they believe, uh, or they believe that technology can support every child to gain an education, um, to help them learn both formally and informally, um, they, they worry that um, they don't have great access at school and that often their teachers are not qualified or supported well enough to ensure that technology can play a, a wonderful role in the classroom. Um, so, so there's some work for us to do there um, uh, and in, around supporting them adequately to take advantage of the educational uh, affordances of digital technology. Last of all, what children's contributions to the consultations remind us is that children's rights are far from abstract legal principles to be debated behind closed doors. Rather, they are dynamic things whose meanings are activated and constantly re refined and reinvented at the level of children's everyday lives. Children are adamant that they want to be um, strong participants in the processes of decision making that go on to influence the ways that they pick up and use digital technology um, in, in the context of their everyday lives. It's our hope um, that the insights documented in the children's consultation alongside the guidance of the General Comment 25, that that guidance can be used by policymakers, professionals, parents and children themselves to ensure that as we collectively apply the convention in accordance with the guidance laid out in general comment 25, the digital environment truly delivers what children want, need and deserve. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amanda. Yeah, and I, I think uh, in the recent years, we can see that many UN documents are uh, developed side by side with children and the civil society. And I think this is really worthwhile. So the children know exactly what is happening and be our partner. This is a wonderful partnership. And thank you for all the work behind. I know this is not easy at all. Very intensive in particular is a worldwide consultation and yeah, so I hope uh, participants today can uh, we can all get the presentations from CRC Asia later on, and they will share you with the PowerPoint and the links and the video clips so we can uh, learn further in details and we can also share. Okay, so uh, now it comes to the last presentation and may I introduce Mr. Siripon Siriaka. Uh, Mr. Siripal Siriaka is the Director of ASEAN Subdivision Foreign Affairs Division of the Office of the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Social Development and Human Security, Thailand. He is also a focal officer of the ASEAN Senior Officials Meeting on Social Welfare and Development of Thailand and has been working on the development of the Regional Plan of Action for the Protection of Children from from all forms of online exploitation and abuse in ASEAN. And today's uh, Sarah Pong's uh, presentation objective is to share the progress in developing the regional plan of action for the protection of children from all forms of online exploitation and abuse in ASEAN. Uh, may I give the floor to Mr. Sarah Pong Syria. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and 
very good afternoon from from Bangkok uh, and very good uh, morning to all you in uh, in Europe and uh, you know elsewhere, right? So uh, thank you also for the opportunity for for me to speak on the on behalf of Southwest Thailand on the topic of the regional plan of action for the protection of children from all forms of online exploitation and abuse or RPA, COEA in short. So <clears throat> I think the, the sequence of, uh, of my presentation uh, fits uh, quite well after the presentation of uh, Professor, uh, Professor Amanda, because uh, you know, the, uh, you know, as, uh, as um, uh, mentioned in her presentation that the, the harm or the, you know, the, the worries expressed by our young children regarding the, you know, the online um, uh, misuse or, you know, the exploitation is a very uh, important issue, uh, you know, throughout the world and also in our region as well. So uh, next slide, please. So my, my presentation today will cover uh, five topics. First, I <clears throat> want to touch a little bit about on the background, and then I will go to the overall goal and uh, objective of the RPA. And next, I would like to uh, touch on the uh, mechanism or the you know the technical working group uh, on the RPA that uh, is very uh, that uh, responsible for the drafting the, the document. Then I will touch on the <clears throat> drafting process of the RPA, and then, then I will end my presentation on the uh, synopsis of the RPA. Next slide, please. For a little bit of background, I think the I think uh, <clears throat> we cannot, um, you know, the um, disregard the the you know uh, the benefits or the the advantage of uh, Internet of Things and also the digital um, technology for, for our modern life, right? So um, <clears throat> in our modern day uh, living, I think the many people, I think most of people uh, use uh, Internet and, uh, you know, the, um, search, you know, the information and also a lot, a lot of things online, right? So, um, you know, there are always, um, uh, two sides of a coin, right? So in, in one, uh, on the bright side, there will be <clears throat> uh, the, the benefits of the internet uh, and digital technology is uh, enormous, right? We, we cannot deny that. And But at the same time, right, <clears throat> um, internet of things and also digital technology uh, can also open some, uh, some loopholes and some uh, uh, windows for, of opportunities for some, you know, um, bad guys, if you like, you know, and also um, expose uh, people, right? Es especially uh, young people to the online exploitation and abuse, right? So with that uh, <clears throat> uh, issue, and uh, you know, in back in 2019, right, during the uh, ASEAN Championship of Thailand, so we uh, the, uh, we proposed and uh, submitted. Uh, one document that that is uh, the declaration on the protection of children from all forms of online exploitation and abuse in ASEAN uh, for adoption by our ASEAN leaders, and uh, <clears throat> and finally the the leaders adopted the, the declaration uh, in the uh, ASEAN summit uh, in Thailand in November two thousand nineteen. So this one, uh, this um, as in document will be the principal uh, document for us to uh, uh, to uh, develop the, the RPA, right? And um, <clears throat> the uh, mechanism that you, you know, um, drive the, the process of uh, drafting the RPA is the, the joint undertaking of uh, ACWC and Samsung Thailand uh, for the AC ACWC Thailand is under uh, guidance and um, you know leadership of um, Mr. Wan Chai Rujanawong, the ACWC uh, representative for Thailand to ACWC on uh, children's rights, and uh, <clears throat> we also um, you know the, uh, collaborate uh, with uh, relevant partners, uh, especially UNICEF, 
and also uh, um, expat uh, to to take the initiative to translate the the principles and the commitments as uh, enshrined in the declaration the declaration into uh, you know uh, further actions. So AC and ACBC and Southwest Thailand. Um, <clears throat> submitted uh, project the project proposal uh, entitled ASEAN Digital Plan of Action for the Protection of Children from All Forms of Online Exploitation and Abuse in ASEAN, which uh, subsequently uh, was uh, endorsed by ACUC and SOMSWAT. And uh, after that, uh, ACUC and SOMSWAT Thailand, uh, we set up the you know, ASEAN uh, Technical Working Group uh, uh, with a mandate to to draft the RPA on COEA, the <clears throat> the drafting uh, the draft uh, RPA COEA will be submitted for notation by the ASEAN leaders uh, during the 30th uh, ASEAN summit in uh, October this year uh, under the chairmanship of Brunei Darussalam. Next slide, please. So the, the overall goal and uh, of objective of uh, the RPA uh, is that uh, the, the overall goal is, the, is to, the, is to uh, eliminate all forms of online exploitation and abuse uh, against children through the implementation of the declaration and also you know, uh, supplement the uh, implement, implementation of the ASEAN Digital Plan of Action on the Elimination of Violence Against Children, also known as the ASEAN uh, uh, EVAC. And also the overall objective of the RPA is to uh, accelerate and uh, translate the actions into you know, uh, um, concrete uh, measures to end all forms of online exploitation and abuse in, in, of children in ASEAN. Uh, next slide, please. This is the um, you know the structure and, and uh, composition of the technical working group on RPA COEA. Uh, this is actually uh, chaired by <clears throat> uh, His Excellency Wan uh, Chai Rujana Wong, Thailand's uh, representative uh, to the ACWC for Children's Rights. And uh, as you can see on the screen, that uh, <clears throat> the technical working group. Uh, comprises uh, for uh, ACUC representatives on children's rights from uh, Brunei Jerusalem, from Malaysia, and uh, from Myanmar, and also from Thailand, and also uh, for some what uh, focal points from Indonesia, uh, Myanmar, Singapore, and also from Thailand. And also we have uh, 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 one, one representative from UNICEF, and one uh, representative from ECPAT and also uh, technical experts from uh, SOMTC and you know, uh, AG, ADG's SOM, and also with the support of the ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, next slide, please. And as you can see on the screen that uh, the drafting uh, process of the, of the draft uh, RPA, you know, uh, actually, the, there are about uh, 18 uh, steps for the drafting process. Uh, it has been more than a, more than a year uh, since we, we uh, start uh, drafting the process uh, back in April uh, last year. So I think the important processes here is uh, number seven and number eight, right, <clears throat> on the screen. Number seven is that uh, we um, conducted the the national uh, consultation uh, back in, in, Th in Thailand, and we engage uh, children and, uh, and young people and also uh, relevant uh, uh, agencies and also CSOs involved. And number eight, uh, as, as you can see on the screen, is that we, uh, we also uh, conducted the consultation uh, of the draft uh, with children in ASEAN online. Uh, these are the you know the important uh, processes. Next slide, please. And actually, we are at uh, number fourteen uh, right now. We 
is uh, has been uh, very uh, challenging but uh, uh, rewarding process uh, to be uh, frank uh, with uh, with all of us uh, today because uh, it's a uh, uh, you know the process of uh, consultations are uh, quite uh, you know quite long and so we are at the consultation for the final draft of, of the IPA and we hope that uh, we can uh, submit uh, the draft IPA for notation uh, uh, for the, the, the for the RC leaders during the 38th summit in, in October. Next slide please. So uh, this is the, the synopsis of the RPA, right? Actually, actually, as you can see on the screen, uh, the first one uh, involves the uh, national legal frameworks and also child protection standards and policies. The second uh, component uh, involves the uh, professional capabilities, you know, uh, whether they are judicial or legal professions. The third part uh, involves the national uh, specialized unit uh, to lead, to support and coordinate, uh, coordinate uh, investiga uh, investigation on COEA. And uh, the fourth uh, component is uh, regarding the, you know, the child protection and support services. And then the fifth uh, component uh, involves uh, data collection and uh, M&E uh, uh, mechanisms. And the sixth uh, part uh, is regarding the national ed education program and, sc and school curricula. And the last uh, part uh, involves the engagement and you know, uh, partnerships with uh, uh, private sector and relevant stakeholders. This is the, the synopsis of the RPA. Next slide, please. So with that, I think, uh, I'm running out of time, so is I would like to end my presentation with with the with the message here is that you know, the, you know all this is the only one uh, you know uh, um, goal is that uh, to make the world a better place and a safer place for our young uh, generations uh, through the implementation of the RPA on COEA. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Siripong Siriaka, for your presentation. I'm glad to know that the ASEANs uh, have have discussion and have action plans on this very important uh, aspect for children. So uh, we we saw that there are very active comments, questions, and answers uh, in the chat box. Um, I think the presenter tried their very best to address uh, the questions, but in case there are any unanswered one, we will make use of the open dis discussion time. But before we move on to the discussion time, we worry that some of you might need to leave early. So it's the photo session time. And I think I need help from the secretaries because <laughs> I don't know when you take the photo, do I need to freeze myself or not? And there are many pages of participants. So I leave it to uh, Hazel or Chef. Maybe I read, uh, even though some of the questions may be answered partly or what. I, I, I think uh, many uh, participants may uh, have a question in mind because uh, we really treasure about the general comment uh, 25, but it seems it's not legal binding. So uh, what, uh, how can we expect this will be uh, taken into serious condition by our government and in the community? So anyone, any presenters want to address this openly? I'll be happy to, Billy. This is Philip. Yeah. Philip, hi. Yes, please do. Very, very briefly. The document that is legally binding is the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is explicitly ratified by all states in the world except one, and I will not name it, but, but everybody knows which one it is. The general comments, and, and this is true 
for, um, and, and don't forget that, that we have three optional protocols, which are also ratified by a certain number of uh, states parties. So this explicit ratification makes them legally binding. States parties do not ratify general comments. Now, on the other hand, there are two elements that make give the general comments strength. The first is that the committee in its interactions with governments in its questions to governments will use the general comment as a backbone for the inquiries that it addresses to governments. And it expects them to answer the, these inquiries on the basis of the framework that we set out in the general comment. That's the first part of the answer. The second is, and this was not brought up in, in, in the presentations. Yes, we consulted, well, it was, it was mentioned that um, there were many, many, many submissions uh, during the process of um, producing the general comment. But there's a crucial step is that we also re, uh, send out the, the draft or the final draft of the general comment to states parties who also have an opportunity to comment on the general comment at, as it is being produced. And therefore you could argue in a sort of a perverse way that many states parties were part of the process of producing the general comment, even though again, it is not legally binding and they have not strictly ratified the document. I hope that clarifies. Back to you, Billy. Thank you. Um, Billy, may I add something? Uh, yes. This is Baroness Kedron. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think the other part of what uh, Philip has just laid out very clearly, mm -hmm. and I speak now as a parliamentarian, that mm -hmm. when I brought the legislation into parliament that, that had to do with data protection for children, we were able to use the convention and to set a bar. So the convention became um, the understanding of what the expectation was. And it had a very profound effect because most legislation related to children online until this point uh, had a child at the age of uh, 13 or 14. Whereas when we, uh, cited the convention on the face of the bill, it became 18 because that is what the convention says. And we're now seeing with the citation of the general comment around the world in regulation, in legislation, in guidance, that that age of 18 is becoming a new normal. So I think there's another lever which has to do with how you frame what is legally binding through a narrative of the convention and specifically the general comment. So I think that that's another use of the general comment that actually seems one step removed, but I have seen it absolutely in action around the world and it makes a remarkable difference. Yeah, I think if we can, if we can all share how we could make good use of the uh, general comment in the context, uh, like in advocating with the government, in the civil society, or how the children put, uh, make good use of it. If we can share this experience uh, among, uh, among us and with the, around the world, we, uh, I, I believe we can make better use of the general form. So I hear some music. Is it mean there's a signal to end the section or what? <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> I think Sonia is raising her hand, Billy. Um, hi, yes, I was just going to add on this um, question. Uh, it was very evident. Should I carry on? Yeah, it was, it was very evident to us um, how uncertain and confused many governments are about the digital world. And so I think even if it's not um, uh, mandatory to implement the general comment, it really answers a need. And one very simple thing would be uh, every time a civil society organization hears of government's confusion or uncertainty or sense of being overwhelmed by the scale of the challenge, 
um, the document becomes, the general comment becomes an answer to a real need. And I think those are often the moments when a document gets taken up and properly read because it does have a lot of answers and is designed to be very kind of practical and relevant. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Zania. There's a, another question to Mr. Siripong Siriaka. Uh, it asks in the uh, Regional Plan of Action uh, to the protection of children from all forms of online exploitation and abuse in ASEAN that is being developed, what mechanism in ASEAN will ensure that the participation of children and youth in monitoring of its targets in different ASEAN countries? Thank you very much for the, for the question. I think the, um, the, the, the question is very uh, important in itself. I think that the, I think uh, various uh, platforms uh, in ASEAN also, you know, and also the uh, platforms uh, organized by, um, you know, um, CSOs and NGOs like, um, like this one, uh, also organized by uh, CRC Asia, is a uh, very really important uh, platforms, you know, you know the, Formally and uh, informally to uh, to engage uh, you know participants uh, from from children and young people, and um, I think um, uh, under some sort we have the <clears throat> you know the ASEAN ASEAN uh, uh, um, Children's Forum uh, uh, you know here you know, annually. Uh, this is uh, just one example that um, you know uh, children and young people in ASEAN. Can can engage uh, fully in in the you know ASEAN uh, affairs if you like, and also to to voice their their views and concerns. And I like I like to also answer uh, I think a, a question from Madam Yum right in, in the chat box if I if I can now uh, Madam Moderator. I think the her question is about you know the. The, the drafting uh, of the RPA and also the the general comment number twenty five that we are talking today, uh, I think she said that the 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 drafting of the RPA uh, was before of uh, before the you know the uh, endorsement of the DC number twenty five. I think um, yes, uh, Madam Yu Yum, uh, that that's quite right that uh, the. Uh, when we first draft the uh, the draft RPA on COEA was before the general comment number twenty five, but I think the the key essence and uh, the salient points are um, in the uh, general comment number 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 twenty five are uh, you know uh, taken into um, consideration and uh, taken on on board already. Uh, some issues like the the risk uh, faced by children online, and also the, you know, the the uh, opportunities for uh, you know the children and also uh, organizations to to take part in the activities. I think these are just just the, the examples that we we have already uh, taken on board uh, and uh, included in the in the draft RPA already. Uh, I hope that I, I have answered uh, the, the queries by uh, Madam Yudum. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions from if not maybe we, we thank you very much for today's presentation and and this exchange in the uh, in the air or in the chat box is wonderful and hope this kind of communication can continue so uh, before we end the session, maybe I pass it to Amiha. Uh, she has something to announce and also we have a video at the end. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank all the resource persons and Billy, thank you for moderating this session. Today, we're really very pleased to have all the participants. We were uh, members, uh, current members and former members of the committee, UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. We had uh, some uh, participants from various UN bodies and uh, government. 
And of course, uh, we're very happy to have our friends from the academe as well as from the business sector because we do know that we, if we want to have this implemented well, we will have to develop more partnerships. And so we're also very happy that we have our civil society friends, uh, organizations uh, from uh, different parts of Asia and the Pacific, as well as some friends who have joined us from Africa, Latin America, and Europe. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we still want to improve this further. You'll notice that uh, for the third session, we have now been able to incorporate our uh, sign language interpreters. I'd like to thank our interpreters for doing such a great job. And I'd like you to please make sure that you send us your feedback. Uh, the, the link is up here. And then also announce that next week we will have the next session will be which will be about children's access to justice uh, but before we end i'd like to ask everyone who can stay on to please look at how one of our members the group development pakistan has been able to try to localize uh, the children's voices and to explain to uh, in language that's friendly to all the general comment so friends, uh, please uh, stay on if you can to watch the, the video prepared by group development and in the a chat box, we'll also send you more information. Thank you so much. The digital world has changed our lives. Adopting and mastering digital technology is the most important need of the hour to build our place in the world and succeed is a matter of time. Many developed countries have included digital technology in the children's early education for a long time. But in many countries of the world, many children do not have access to the digital world even today. Recently, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child approved General Comment Number 25. Emphasis has been placed on taking the necessary steps for children's access and safe use of this digital world. According to the UN Committee, digital technologies are critical to children's development, protection and their future. The Committee has proposed several important steps to achieve these goals. Those include Don't discriminate. All children should have equal access to digital technology regardless of gender, color, race, region, nationality, or religion. Protecting the interest of the children. When formulating policies regarding the digital world, the interests of children should be taken into consideration first, and policies that are in the best interest of the children should be formulated. The right to life, protection, and development. The goal of this digital world is to create an environment for children to develop their mind in a better way and provide the necessary education and training for their development and protection. Appropriate measures need to be taken to prevent negative and violent content in the digital world. Respect for children's opinion. In order to instill confidence and commitment in children, it is important that their opinions be heard, understood and respected. If digital technology is used properly and children are trained and guided in the digital world, they will be able to better communicate their view locally, nationally and globally. In the digital world, on one hand, there are countless opportunities to grow, learn and move forward, but there are also many dangers. The United Nations urges its member states to formulate an integrated, effective and comprehensive policy and strategy in consultation with children regarding children's access to the digital world and to provide the necessary measures and resources for this purpose. Join us in empowering children to access and protect their digital rights and make our children dignified citizens of the modern world.
Okay, thank you so much, everyone. I'm so happy that you joined us today. Uh, again, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh